This podcast is part of Mishmash Media. Hello, co-host from hell. <laughs> oh, this is the podcast from hell. Oh, yeah, it is the podcast. It's the second podcast that we do from hell. Curbcast, yes. And welcome to another episode of that podcast. This is episode four of season three. And every week, myself, Ivan, and my buddy Stephen over there, uh, we get episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm in chronological order, and we review them scene by scene. And uh, Stephen, we are doing something which is actually uh, Richard Lewis's supposed catchphrase. We're doing the nanny from hell today. Yeah, a, a strange part of the storyline, you know, that he's trying to get credit for the blank from hell for coming up with that phrase. But they they handle it pretty well. When I realized that that was going to be his storyline and a main part of the the overall storyline, I thought, eh, that's a bit weird, but it, uh, it works out pretty well. And it's something that actually happened in real life. Uh, so apparently uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations, they're actually a real life publication or a book. Uh, they did in fact reject his quotes, although the Yale book of quotations accepted it. So uh, oh. he does have, you know, re- he is recognized by another publication, but just not the one in the show. Right. I didn't realize that. I must admit, I didn't uh, have or look up any trivia for this episode. So uh, Mm. I missed that one. If you want to try and get credit for a quote that you claim to have come up with, you can email uh, curbcastpod at gmail.com or on all forms of social media. And uh, make sure you check out all of our previous episodes on our podcast feed, as well as our first podcast that we did, but I don't want to be a secondary character. Uh, And if you are listening to this on Patreon, thank you so much for being a supporter. And uh, you do get access to this episode early. And uh, if you think that anyone else might want to be a Patreon to get access to this episode earlier, uh, just let them know. Indeed. But anyway, Steve, let's get into it, hey? Season 3, Episode 4 of Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Nanny from Hell. Aired in the US on the 6th of October 2002. The restaurant investors plan a pool party, but only Larry and Jeff show up. Larry goes to use the bathroom in the main house and winds up getting the nanny fired. Larry recommends the nanny to Jeff and Susie. After the nanny snaps, Susie's life is threatened. Meanwhile, while Richard Lewis tries to get into the Bartlett's book of quotations for claiming to have invented the phrase the blank from hell like we mentioned before and uh, it's funny how with Martine the whole the Looney Tunes theme you know kind of triggers her the Martine the nanny yeah in a way it kind of reminded me of uh, Kramer in Seinfeld being triggered by can't remember her name's voice from uh, Entertainment Tonight and uh, he just sort of bursts out into these involuntary spasms you know obviously (laughs) (laughs) Martine's freakouts are a bit darker they are it had that kind of uh it, it reminded me of that. Oh, it did, did a bit, yeah, except like you said, Kramer doesn't go psychotic and try to throw pregnant women off balconies. No, he just goes into a spasmodic dance. <laughs> spasmodic, yeah, that's right. Anyway, in the first scene of this episode, Bobo's The Restaurant is continuing renovations in the lead up to its opening in two weeks' time. Larry chats to a plumber and is making jokes about marble, which the plumber isn't interested in. A publisher named Hugh invites Larry to a pool party at his place, which he accepts. He tells him about Richard Lewis's phrase, the blank from hell, and if it can go into the Bartlett's book of quotations and Hugh says that he'll have a look at it. Jeff arrives and says that he's going to the pool party and that he's bringing his ex-wife Susie. Uh, He reveals that she is pregnant and that he is moving back in with her and he asks Larry to keep it a secret and only tell Cheryl. So this is quite a revelation. Yeah, I think Larry is not too impressed, I guess, and uh, he doesn't think that it'll work out. He sarcastically says, oh yeah, this is great. This is fantastic. Uh, And I think Jeff on some level knows that even though he's moving back in and his wife's pregnant, that, you know, it won't work out. He's already separated from Cheryl, uh, sorry, from Susie once. And uh, I think they both know that it's bound to happen again because Jeff's you know, let's be honest, isn't the best husband. And not the best father either to their daughter after stealing the brownies from uh, two weeks ago. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Deep down, Jeff knows that uh, it's inevitable that he won't uh, reform himself as a father or a husband. And uh, the same thing that's already happened will just happen again down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty bad for uh, the daughter and Susie and Ned. Larry can see it. He can see it's not going to, it's basically bound to fail. Yeah, I mean, as flawed as Larry is, you have to give him credit for being quite perceptive. And, uh, you know, knowing Jeff well, He's been his manager for a long time and they've been friends for ages. He can kind of, you know, he has a lot of insight. He does, yeah. He's he's more deep than we think. Yeah, and I I think, you know, and he's also cynical enough to expect that to happen anyway. He expected, yeah, because he knows Jeff like the the back of his hand. Like when we interviewed Kenny Kramer on our previous podcast, or our other one, uh, he said that Larry can read him like a book. (laughs) So I'm sure in in this universe, Larry can read Jeff like a book. Yeah, I mean, Larry does have that gift of perceiving what seems like mundane behavior and and extracting a bit more meaning out of it. 
And uh, I think that's what he's doing in this case. Mm -hmm. I think so too. The next day or later on at the day of the pool party, Larry and Cheryl walk into a bakery who was going out of business. They order a cake for the pool party and Larry suggests a sponge cake, but Cheryl wants something else. They order the sponge to Larry's uh, <laughs> Larry's recommendation and insistence. Yeah, a sponge cake seems like a weird food gift to take to a pool party. Mm-hmm. To me, something you take to a pool party is, you know, like something like dip and chips or like a salad. A sponge cake just seems, unless you've been asked to bring dessert, a sponge cake can't really go around to i mean how many people are at the party you sit in the next scene but what 50 40 50 60 people just no more than like that a, i think yeah it's, it seems like a very strange gift unless you've been asked specifically to bring a cake or dessert uh to bring to a pool party yeah very strange but i feel like with larry he probably wants something which is like a safe option you know he probably doesn't want to bring something exotic so he'd rather bring something tried and true well in his mind what's tried and true yeah look i don't think he's thinking oh i'll bring this sponge cake and all the other people will enjoy it it's i really like this sponge cake and that's all there is to it if no one else eats it. <laughs> and then we find out Jeff really likes it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Larry's not too happy about that. <laughs> He's not. And uh, something else happens with the sponge cakes a bit later on. Uh, at the pool party, the Greens and the Davids, they're chatting by the pool. Jeff asks where the sponge came from and Larry says that they're going out of business. Why do you need to know the name of the business? Uh, he mentions it after some much insistence from Jeff. Uh, Larry heads to the bathroom in the main house, even though he's supposed to go to the cabana. As he's about to walk in, he asks the nanny who's guarding the door if he can go into the house but she refuses and eventually with a bit of uh, you know talking Larry convinces her to let him go into the house yeah he uh, he he can be charming occasionally and uh, he turns the sweet talk on and uh, convinces the nanny to let him go to the loop. Because Larry, he's very, uh, you know, neurotic and stuff as well. He probably feels that a cabana is probably too close to everyone else. He wants probably at least a few walls <laughs> in between him and, and the patrons of the pool party. Yeah, look, Larry's probably got a whole bunch of toilet rules, you know, distance between people when using a toilet. And he's probably got a whole legislation in his mind about toilet customs. And uh, this is probably just one of them. Yeah, it probably is. Um, yeah, but it's pretty funny how Martine, like it first martine this is the first time we see her she uh, appears pretty nice and friendly and warm <laughs> and uh, and later on we see her true colors especially when the looney tunes theme plays yeah it's uh it's a slow descent into madness and every scene that she's in you can see her progressively becoming a bit more looney tune herself this is like seven seasons of larry's descent into madness uh you know just uh it's shortened into one episode for martine yeah, yeah into <laughs> just short of one episode yeah <laughs> uh, Larry, he, he's done in the bathroom. He runs into Hugh again outside before going back into the group. They wonder how he went into the bathroom. So Larry, I'm Cher- oh, sorry, Cheryl, Jeff and Susie. Uh, Larry wonders if there's anyone else from the restaurant and because they figure that, that they're the only investors there. I mean, Ted Danson isn't there. Richard York isn't there. Um, you know, the other people who, you know, do all the meetings and stuff, no one's there and uh, they feel pretty, uh, pretty bummed. You know, and sometimes have you ever been in a situation where you go to a party and you're like the only person, you know, someone's invited you and they're like, oh, yeah, there'll be other people that you might know and then you rock up and then you're like the only person like that they know or you don't know the other people that are there and you have to like meet them have you ever been in that situation yeah i've been in several social situations where the only person i know is the person who invited me but yeah me too sometimes it's worked out well because you just fit in with these new people and you know you it's like your old friends but sometimes you do feel like an outsider so each each time it's worked out different yeah but at least larry is with other people like people he knows so it's not too bad i guess and they're not social enough when I first watched this episode and they were making a point of them being the only ones at the pool party, I expected it to be a problem later on where maybe Ted and all the other investors find out about the party and find out that they weren't invited and Hugh has to sort of yeah. explain himself and Larry, but it turns out to be the complete opposite. <laughs> I know. It's fun. But anyway, as I was saying, as they ask who from the restaurant's there, uh, he gawks or Larry turns around and sees Hugh's son like from the front and he claims that his son has a huge huge penis as they make their way out of the party. They call them porn baby later on. I know. It's, uh, I mean, you know, if you're in that situation and you notice a kid has a freakishly large penis, I understand trying to, like, I understand making a comment about it, especially amongst trusted family and friends, you know, in this case, Cheryl, Jeff and Susie. But the fact that they all kind of just stop what they're doing, look at it, and they all talk about it so casually uh, is is kind of weird to me. I, I would feel kind of creepy too. Yeah. If, you know, sometimes when you're in, in a moment, you're in, in a conversation and then you kind of have a, a third party point of view, you observe yourself in that moment, you go, hang on, what am I doing? What, like, why did I mm. let myself get into this situation? If I were any of them, except maybe Larry, because he doesn't think 
being like a normal person, I would be stepping outside of myself going, hang on, why are we casually joking and talking about some strange kid's penis? That's It's just a, you know, none of them said anything inappropriate or sexual or anything, but it's just a cringy, weird topic of conversation. So the fact that they, they do it and do it without any sort of hang ups is very, very strange to me. I think it's probably the shock more than anything. I feel like if you saw like an eight year old and they had something down to their knee, you'd probably be like, holy shit. <laughs> So yeah, it's probably like the first the first situation. But then it's it's only Larry that seems to be more interested in it as the episode goes. Like Cheryl and Jeff don't really care afterwards. Yeah. No, that's why I said I, I understand why you would initially notice it and say something. But to continue after just saying, oh, wow, look at that, to then talk about it as if it's just, you know, oh, how's the food? Oh, the food's great. You know, oh, how's that kid's penis? Oh, it's huge. Yeah, whatever. Anything, <laughs> after, that, anything after that initial shock reaction for me is just strange. The fact that it just turns into a casual conversation amongst friends is uh is is odd it's very odd it's very odd larry and richard they arrive at a crowded restaurant uh he tells richard about his quote uh, that he told the publisher richard he's extremely impressed with this and he wonders if the publisher knew that the line the blank from hell was richard's trademark uh, larry says uh not sure he tells richard that hugh will go to the hbo screening of richard's special and uh, richard says it'll be an opportunity to talk to him about that a man next to them because they're in like a really crowded diner sort of thing a man nearby <laughs> says uh, that he's having the lunch from hell and Larry wonders where he got it from. Yeah, they they kind of think that the guy's listening in or something like that. Like Larry says, you having a good time? Mm. Something like that. Yeah, because they're so close together. Yeah, and the guy, if you watch the scene and you watch the guy, the guy doesn't look over. He doesn't pay any attention to them whatsoever. He doesn't react. He doesn't. But yeah, because he just happens to be sitting very close to Larry given the the restaurant's layout, Larry automatically thinks that he's up to something or that he has to give him a hard time. And uh, the guy Mm. just goes, yeah, mate, I'm just eating my lunch. He tries to, you know, not be involved at all. Uh, and then, yeah, but then it turns out that he says, I'm having the lunch from hell. And um, Larry's uh, curious. Larry and Richard are curious. Yeah. They're wondering how they got how we got that line. I think he says his girlfriend said it or something. Yeah. And, it, and, and you know, every time Richard is not attributed credit for coming up with that line, it sort of ticks him off. It does. Yeah, because it's crazy. Like, you think that's something which even we've used in our vernacular, the blank from hell. I mean, I've used that many times in my life. It's quite unbelievable that it comes from a comedian from the 80s and 90s. Yeah. I mean, it makes me think of how many things I say just in, in everyday communication that are probably attributable to a person who's still alive or relatively speaking isn't that old but you don't you don't think about these things you just you just say stuff and unless it's a quote from a movie that you're all intentionally quoting um, hmm. you just happen to know because you randomly know about the origins of some line most things we say you know were initially said by someone at some point in history but we just we just talk and it just comes out so the fact that yeah something so common uh, I mean I don't use it very often but it's not it's certainly not an uncommon line in life uh, mm. yeah yeah the fact that it came from a living, breathing comedian who we're talking about right now is uh, is strange, you know? It's strange, but it's funny how the line came out in like 30 years, 40 years ago, you know? Like it's not something which came out like the 1800s and someone, you know, coined it uh, or like a philosopher and author or something. It was like just a stand-up comedian who used it in their bits. And it was like, you know, during our lifetime while we were alive, <laughs> it, it came out. It's just really strange. It's just one of those phenomenon that something that was part of a, a comedy routine just became every day, like was just used every day by by every single person and no one it's so mm. common you don't even think oh, i wonder where that comes from especially on current affair shows like today tonight and the current affair <laughs> the neighbor from hell <laughs> Love that. Like, yeah, with big dramatic and like usually a red stamp. Yeah. We were in creative red tape. The neighbor from Dodge. hell. The politician from Dodge. hell. Dodgy tradesman. Dodgy the tradesman from hell. The investors are having a meeting at Bobo's and they're wondering who should be the head chef after the events of the last episode. Larry accosts the other investors for not going to Hugh's pool party. They're trying to figure out who should be the head chef and Larry suggests a chef at the diner who had great apple sauce. <laughs> he wants to get some cook from a diner who had decent apple sauce to be like the head chef of a five-star celebrity restaurant. <laughs> yeah, sounds like he's really clutching at straws. Yeah, I mean, his reason for not employing uh, Ted Danson's personal chef, I can't remember his name from last week. Uh, Josh. Is that, Josh, is that the dish was a bit too saucy. That was it. But uh, a non-fine dining, I mean, this chef at the diner could be perfectly capable of cooking at a at a high-end restaurant. Who knows? But uh, it, it's sort of ironic in a way that too much sauce was uh, the reason for not employing Josh. But 
this chef's specific sauce is what is uh, making Larry <laughs> him at this restaurant. And an apple sauce of all things. Yeah, I mean, apple sauce is so, I don't know, like so mundane. The fact that Larry would think it appropriate to be a condiment at a at a five-star, you know, at a fine dining celebrity chef is, is you know, just another incidence of Larry just being completely out of touch with reality. Or at least, you know, like I said, you know, trying to clutch at straws because he's already made the investment. He's probably hoping to yeah. put someone, anyone in because they're opening in two weeks. So he's just... He's just trying everyone he can. Um, but, it but anyway. It doesn't seem to suggest it out of desperation, like, oh, you know, we've got no other option. Let's suggest this guy. Larry just seems to suggest it casually. And I think I think even if they weren't desperate for a chef, if they were six months away from opening, I think Larry still would have suggested it. Mm, yeah, probably. Yeah, just, you know, just because. Yeah, and, and obviously the uh, the other investors, Ted and uh, the rest, aren't, aren't interested at all. They don't even want to talk about it because they realize that their priority isn't whether they should have applesauce at the restaurant, but uh, they just need to find a chef. Mm, that's it. Yeah, because they need someone to, you know, tailor the menu and come up with some stuff. And then two weeks yeah. is not much time. No, no, no. I mean, even if you've got a menu ready to go, two weeks, yeah, is not a lot of time. A chef has to get their kitchen in order. They have to get their staff right. They have to get their systems down. They have to, yeah, it's not a lot. No. After the meeting, Larry singles out Hugh and, uh, you know, he mentions casually his son's big penis as a compliment. And uh, Hugh gets really offended naturally and he walks off and Larry's like, what? What are you talking? What are you doing? He doesn't understand. He can't see the he can't see the woods from the trees. Literally, <laughs> <laughs> the wood. <laughs> Before we get on to the next scene, I think it's important because uh, it kind of sets up a joke that pays off later. When uh, Hugh walks away, Larry says, "Come on, you!" But Hugh thinks that he's saying, "Come on, Hugh." <laughs> Come on, uh, Hugh. That's right. Yes. Yeah, and he goes, "My name's Hugh," and and Larry realizes that he's just mistaken what he said. Like Hugh's mistaken what Larry said, and uh, and Larry goes, "Come on, Hugh, Hugh." And you think that's a that's a strange ending to a scene, but it does pay off later. Yeah, he just loves Larry. Just loves saying the name, and uh, yeah, it does pay off in the end. In the next scene, Cheryl is chatting to the nanny Martine from the pool party at her home as Larry walks through the door. He she says that she was fired due to Larry's actions, and that the home chef ratted her out for this Margarita, who uh, apparently had it in for her quite a lot. Uh, she says that she didn't tell Hugh that it was Larry, and Martine tries to ask them if she can stay with them. Martine suggests that Larry talk to Hugh to hire her back. Larry is very hesitant because because he's scared to tell them about the chat previously at the restaurant regarding <laughs> Hugh's son's penis. Cheryl asks to speak to Larry in the kitchen in private. They discuss what's happening and that Cheryl doesn't want the nanny from hell here. Larry claims that that's Richard's line because it's, so it's actually Cheryl that comes up with the nanny from hell idea or concept. Yeah, no, she she coins the title of the episode, but uh, Larry at every instance says, oh, by the way, that's uh, Richard Lewis's, you know, he came up with the blank from hell. He loves pointing out irrelevant things in situations that require immediate attention. Mm, and then he asked Cheryl, where did you get it from? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's not the point in this scene. Larry has to figure out what to do with Martine. But being Larry, he just becomes distracted by something completely irrelevant. Kind of like the applesauce. You know, they're sitting around stressed about a chef and Larry's crapping on about applesauce. In this scene, you know, Cheryl and Larry have to figure out very quickly what to do with Martine. And Larry sort of, you know, he gets distracted and talks about... The nanny from hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and it's fine to talk about, but not at this very moment. You know, they, they need to address no. something pressing. And then later on... The day say hey by the way you know that line that you said before uh, Larry uh, sorry Richard came up with that just inappropriate yeah timing. they have a mentally ill lady you know in their couch on their couch with a suitcase <laughs> and she's homeless <laughs> so they have to try and you know figure that out first yeah priority number one is that mm, it, uh, it is Cheryl isn't happy with Martine as she seems weird from what she says uh, Larry suggests that Martine should work for Jeff as their nanny recently quit and because of Susie's you know upcoming baby they probably need the help one thing I did notice in this scene and it's a continuous of what we've talked about the last couple of episodes is Cheryl seemed a lot more passive in this episode. Yes. Uh, sorry, in this scene. And, yes. And in this episode in general, actually. I, I think if this scene were part of a season one or two episode, Cheryl would have demanded that Larry get rid of Martine and that having Martine become Jeff's nanny is a terrible idea. But she doesn't go along with it fully in this scene. But, you know, you can sense a bit of reluctance. She's a bit like, oh, I don't know about that. But, uh, you know, she doesn't sort of push too hard against Larry's ideas. Um, and I think it's just her... Yeah, her continuing to be a lot more passive and just sort of switching off 
from their relationship and checking out slowly. Much like what we out. talked about last week too. We talked about that, yeah, how exactly. the, you know, the relationship isn't quite on the rocks, but it's on the way there. Yeah, it, it's almost like she thinks, even if it's subconsciously, you know, these problems that present themselves all the time with Larry, these little weird complications that come up. It's like her not fighting is her saying to Larry subconsciously or subtly, I, I don't care and I'm not really mm. fighting for this relationship anymore. You know, I'm not, I don't feel threatened by these instances anymore or the I don't care if the relationship relationship is threatened by this constant drama so i'm just not going to fight i'm just going to go yeah whatever and just go along with it just go along with it yeah yeah which uh which hey we might see later on in the season that it gets worse and worse yeah it, it seems to be a, a slowly unfolding change of dynamic in their relationship mm, it is a very short scene larry is driving martine to jeff's as she's singing the looney tunes theme uh, larry drives past the bakery which they went to before the one going out of business and he orders all 12 sponge cakes available as uh, jeff loves them <laughs> You know, we got to uh, stop off and get some sponge cake. Okay. It's my friend's birthday. Oh. Yeah, I'm buying him some sponge cake. There you go. You like sponge cake? Who doesn't? Yeah. They arrive at Jeff's with the, with the sponge cakes as Martine rings the doorbell. Susie answers the door and she accosts Larry for buying heaps of sponge cakes because the bakery didn't actually have boxes for them. They only had, uh, you know, cling foil or cling wrap to wrap them in. So Larry's got a dozen sponge cakes wrapped in like plastic. I love how he's just carrying them. I know. It's it's one of those instances <laughs> where Larry's heart's in the right place. Of, oh, I'll, I'll swing by the bakery because uh, it's going out of business and pick up a cake uh, or pick up something for my friend because he likes it and uh, there won't be any more opportunities once they close down. But buying mm. 12 is just ridiculous. It's heart's in the right place. Uh, yeah. Didn't think about it, though. Didn't think it through. You know, one cake, two cakes is fine. 12 cakes, no. A bit much. But Larry does explain this. He explains to Susie that they're going out of business. And Susie says, Jeff's fat enough as it is. <laughs> He's already fat. You know, he, he, she hates him being fat. Martine congratulates Susie for her pregnancy, which gets her mad because Susie says to Larry, you weren't supposed to tell anyone, you know, how? why did you tell her, this stranger? You know, it was meant to be between us. Susie invites them both in reluctantly. And um, in the next scene, it, well, it actually cuts to another part of that scene where Susie, she throws all of 12 sponge cakes uh, near the trash. So not quite in their dumpster, but it's just outside it on the floor. Yeah, no, a few, a few things from this scene. And uh, I did mention it before. For, you can sense that Susie, you know, Jeff in the opening scene is, uh, he seems relatively happy that uh, he's getting back together with Susie because she's pregnant again. But Susie, yeah. I'm assuming based on the fact that uh, Susie just openly insults her uh, just returned husband's weight, you know, he's fat enough already. She probably, you know, in her mind thinks, well, I don't really like Jeff that much, but the fact that we're about to have a new baby, you know, an extra set of hands will be handy. I think she's reluctantly taken him back. And um, I also like the fact that she doesn't even think that Larry's cakes are good enough to throw in the normal bin. You know, they're so, they're so, she thinks so little of them that rather yeah. than open the bin lid and put them in the bin that they go next to the bin, which to me is like, you know, if, if, if I gave a gift to someone and they threw it in the bin, obviously that's very hurtful but if they threw it next to the bin the bin's not even yeah on the it. it's like an ex it's like an extra layer of i don't give a shit about <laughs> these cakes yeah like she she has like no she she holds no value on those cakes yeah, nothing yeah. at all they're not even yeah. worth the bin they don't even deserve no. to be in the bin they deserve to be outside the bin and i did like the editing choice uh it sort of smash cuts to her just throwing them out you know you don't see her yeah them up or that's the word i meant smash cut yeah 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 you don't see her like pretend to put them in the fridge like when larry's there and then get them out of the fridge when larry leaves to take them out to the bin just straight away uh, open the door, <laughs> thrown and even the camera angle is perfect it's you know it's sort of filmed from the almost from the bin's perspective looking up at Susie yeah you just see her with this big pile of cakes and just lobs them at the almost door. like it's CCTV footage yeah 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 it's uh I think it was a specific editing choice they did to really make the point that she hates Larry so much and she hates the fact that Larry bought over cakes yeah I, I think it was done specifically to highlight her, her feelings about Larry and the cakes yeah I think so too at the screening later on that night Larry Richard and Jeff are waiting in the foyer for the movie to start Richard asks if Larry can introduce him to Hugh and Larry hesitates after what happened Jeff gets a call saying that Martine has attacked Susie and that he has to leave a 
Larry says that he should go, but Richard says that he'll collapse if he leaves. Hugh and the sun run past, uh, also known as the porn baby. That's what uh, I think Richard calls him that, the porn baby. Um, but yeah, Richard, he's really, he really, um, we mentioned in a couple of episodes ago in the Benadryl Brownie, Steve, that Richard, he really has to rely on Larry to get him through. And he even says, like, it's, it kind of sounds like half sarcastic when he says, I'll collapse if you leave. And Larry kind of laughs at him saying, collapse, what are you talking about? But I feel like Richard is kind of uh, giving like a cry for help to keep Larry there. Yeah. And I think um, the fact that he, and it kind of, you know, plays into what we talked about last week as well, where he seems to be seeking validation. And the fact that he- has Oh, two weeks ago. Sorry, two weeks ago. Yeah. And the fact that he yeah. uh, has this opportunity to potentially be officially attributed to creating the line of the, the blank from hell. Obviously, that's a boost of professional and creative self-confidence and it would be very vindicating because I'm sure you know Richard Lewis seems like a man who carries around a lot of uh, a lot of pain a lot of regret and a lot of you know a lot of grudges so the fact that he you know is almost going to be well up until this scene he thinks he's going to be uh, officially credited that would be very relieving and vindicating for him yeah but I expected him and I think it's another sign of Richard changing as a person you know in season one and two he was quite angry he'd always sort of be confrontational towards Larry and in this scene when Larry goes oh look I don't think it's going to happen because of what I said about to Hugh about his son's penis Richard you can he, he sort of what his lines aren't the main part of the conversation but if you listen carefully you can hear him say like oh I, I can't remember exactly what he says but it's almost like rather than be angry with Larry if, if it was season one I think he would almost get into a fight with Larry like you cost me this opportunity but in this he just seems defeated he's just like oh, oh okay hmm. So, yeah, I think it's just another sign of him becoming less and less angry and more just sort of sad and and trying to and depressed really yeah probably almost like the seven stages of grief right so he was ang- he was denying you know in season one then he was angry a lot and now he's kind of you know depressed and uh, hopefully in the later seasons we'll see that he's accepted what's going on and he can uh, move on this is like yeah. the character arc for Richard I think so yeah and I think it's really really good writing you know people people like Richard you know people that are hard to get along with that you know struggle to form relationships it's easy it's convenient for a writer to just always rely on the same ideas that you know they always fuck things up that they're always angry that they're always pushing people away but the fact that they're trying to evolve Richard and you know it, they're not changing him they're not transforming him but they're just sort of slowly adding nuance to his character I think is a really really good writing choice and how yeah. they show that is really intelligent as well just little things like how he reacts to Larry when he finds out that he can't go that he won't be attributed the quote again you know season one I think he would have exploded or, or gotten into an argument with Larry but in this one he just sort of seems like oh fuck okay damn like he just seems depressed and disappointed more than angry and defeated yeah, I, I like how that he's got this character arc. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it later in, in the in the season and beyond. Um, but anyway, they're watching the special as the boy is being annoying, his son with the big penis. <laughs> Larry tells the boy to shush, and they begin to have a childish argument together, which escalates. Uh, Richard looks on in horror. He's looking uh, at from another seat closer to the to the screen. <laughs> Eventually, Hugh gets involved and gets upset, and Larry says, "Fuck you, fuck you," and then Hugh goes, "Fuck you." <laughs> and uh, they, Hugh and this boy walk off and Richard, he knows once again, he's, he feels defeated and he knows there's no chance he'll ever get into that book after what Larry's done. And this is the payoff for uh, Larry using the word Hugh in, uh, for you. Fuck Hugh. Fuck Hugh. <laughs> it's very, very good. Just how, yeah, Larry realises that at this point he he can't convince, he's not going to be able to convince Hugh to consider Richard Lewis's line to be in the book. No, nah, uh, it's done. He said about his son's penis and he's just got, he's like, I've got nothing to lose. I'm just going to insult him and also yeah. insult his name and yeah. insult his son in the same a trifle <laughs> insult in the middle of my friend's special. Uh, and he just goes right in and uh, it's it's brilliant. This is Yeah, he's really on the attack. It's a great scene, probably my favourite scene in the episode. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people talk about Larry David in Curb as being just this sort of misanthropic, you know, asshole who just goes around and sort of makes life hell for everyone. But most of the time it's kind of, you know, and that is true, but most of the time it's just accidental. You know, he doesn't set out to do the wrong thing or he doesn't just go up to people and insult them. And it's rare that he just goes, you know what? I'm just going to be an asshole. I'm going to lean into my assholishness and just go right for it. And he does in this. Mm. And I think it's brilliant. Yeah, he probably just didn't like you at all, even from the start. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they, they seem to get along. You know, the fact that they're co-investors. Professionally. In the Professionally, yeah. They, the fact that they're co-investors in the restaurant means that they've interacted, I'm assuming, fairly regularly throughout this season because they have, they're having regular meetings. And things that aren't shown in an episode that Hugh's done has probably pissed Larry off and, you know, he's just gotten to the point he's like you know what fuck Hugh Hugh (laughs) fuck Hugh I love it 
yeah. <laughs> and the way, him, even the way he uh, says you, the way his mouth looks, just made me laugh. He you. Fuck you. You. He you. He you. Oh, that's I love it. And in the final scene, Larry, he arrives at Jeff's house to see if Susie is okay. Uh, she's in bed resting. Uh, he apologizes for introducing the nanny to her, and Susie says that Martine is mentally ill. And very interesting, Stephen, something which hasn't happened before on the show uh, since we've watched it, a black and white flashback sequence occurs detailing the events of what happened. So hearing the Looney Tunes theme, Susie's daughter is watching. Uh, it triggers Martine, causing Susie to run in and wonder what the hell's going on. And Martine and Susie, they both have a physical confrontation. They grab each other and they lead onto the balcony. Martine, she pushes the pregnant Susie off the balcony and it's revealed that her fall was broken by the 12 sponge cakes she dumped on the ground before. Yeah, no, a very satisfying ending and a, a very nice payoff. It wasn't even really a joke that was set up. I mean, they could have ended it with her just throwing out the cheesecakes and that would have been a satisfying ending to that little tiny storyline uh, in the episode. But the fact that they get more out of it and uh, it, it is, you know, what breaks her fall and prevents a more serious injury was just a really, really smart choice. Wow. So it's something that Susie hated actually saved her life. Yeah. And um, I wouldn't be surprised given, given the writing choices they're making in this season, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, and I might be wrong, but if uh, maybe Susie sort of calms down a bit, maybe this will be an opportunity for her to go, you know what, I could have been seriously injured or maybe even could have died and lost my baby. The fact that I very rudely threw out Larry's cakes you know, as, as stupid as they were as a gift, they were still a gift and she was still very mean about it. The fact that they saved my life, you know, those sort of moments in life give you pause and they, they make you reconsider and go, you know, hang on, maybe I shouldn't be so antagonistic. So maybe that's how, you know, Susie will change as a character later on in this uh, season. I feel like in this scene, she already has kind of changed because when Larry is, when Susie explains to Larry what's going on, he's not, she's not angry at him. She's just kind of like in shock. And she's probably thinking, shit, these are the cakes that Larry got me and actually saved my life. Maybe I kind of owe Larry. Larry and, you know, maybe I should be nicer to him. So you probably got a good point. Yeah. So maybe later in the season, she'll be a bit more, probably still have a bit of a nasty streak, but probably be a bit more mellow, maybe towards Larry. It'd probably be a thing where maybe she's, you know, antagonizing towards Jeff or maybe really kind to Larry. It could be one of those yeah. situations. Yeah, I, I think you're right. If she didn't have the um, near, I don't want to say near death, but the near severe industry, uh, industry, injury, Inju experience. injury, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and Larry comes over and he's apologetic. He goes, oh, like, you know, I'm sorry about the nanny and I feel responsible, blah, blah, blah. If she just had a scuffle with the nanny but she didn't fall off the balcony she would have been very pissed off with Larry like how could you bring that woman over here she would have just gone yeah. right in on, on Larry and blamed him for her sort of freaking out but yeah the fact that she attempted uh, to murder Susie oh, attempted to kill her yeah by throwing her off the yeah. balcony. That's attempted murder. The fact that she doesn't lay that blame directly at Larry's feet because of the fact that Larry just sort of incidentally and accidentally saved her by uh, bringing the sponge cakes, yeah, to me shows a, a deviation in her character and I'm, I'm hoping they explore it more. I hope so too. I mean, it, it'd be a bit sucky if Susie, you know, next episode is the same, has the same attitude towards Larry. I'd be pretty disappointed. But yeah, hopefully there is some kind of, you know, arc regarding that. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like, you know, here we are speculating about, oh, maybe they'll take the character in this direction. But but much like Seinfeld and, you know, Curb Your Enthusiasm, there is a philosophy of no hugging, no learning. Uh, and that's, you know, that's pretty common in Curb where, you know, you think people start to humanize a bit more and then the writer to the audience being us just go, you know what, fuck you, we're, we're going to yeah. make her just, you know, she's not going to, she's not going to grow as a person. Or they'll give her a situation where maybe, you know, she's in, uh, or Larry's in Susie's good books and then, you know, Larry does something even dumber the next episode or two and then, you know, they're back to square one. No, I, I think the ultimate point is that we're trying to make in terms of writing is that they seem to be flex the writers of this season seem to be a bit more confident they seem to be flexing their character arc muscles a bit more and uh taking their characters even if it's a slight deviation but they're just sort of taking them in in more unpredictable and interesting you know down interesting routes and i think yeah that's what they're doing with Susie. but writers also rely on on going back to basics as well so they might like you said they might Susie might soften for a few episodes and then yeah larry does something even dumber <laughs> and then the mm. she's just straight back to just treating him like a piece of shit as well. So yeah, yeah. lots of, lots of potential choice. Yeah, lots of choice and, and something dumb but not life threatening like what happened. Yeah, yeah, hopefully not. But anyway, that was the nanny from hell. How many Larrys do you give it out of five, buddy? Uh, you know what? When I watched this, so my opinion on this episode changed as I watched it. The first time I watched it, it's probably about two and a half. I thought it's okay. You know, the the son's penis thing and the cakes being the uh, reason for Susie not being more seriously injured was uh, was funny. And I just thought, yeah, it's okay. 
okay. But then I watched it a second time and I was like, oh no, it's actually a lot better. Uh, and then I watched it just before we recorded it. And I'm like, actually, this episode's pretty good. But out, now after talking about it and uh, we focused, I think, in this episode, you know, chat about it a lot more about the writing choices, more so than just what happens in the episode. Yeah. As I'm thinking yeah. about it from that perspective, I think that this episode's the best of season three so far. And I'm going to give Great. it four and a half Larrys out of five. Beautiful, mate. Beautiful. Well, for me, I originally gave it two and a half Larrys. But after our discussion, I'll give it uh, like our next extra half mark of three like I, I'm not I don't hold it in that high of an esteem as you do I think there were some good parts I mean the, the penultimate episode at the screening was pretty great but yeah I mean it, I feel like it was I don't know it just wasn't as funny or lacking um, but I do agree with you I mean there, there's more confidence in the writing and yeah hopefully they have more uh, they, they make more leaps of faith and do something really daring yeah I mean if you watch season one and season two season one especially the the episodes are quite self-contained you know there are some overarching storylines that carry through the season but each each episode episode is just Larry does something stupid people are pissed off Larry tries to make amends it doesn't really work out and then it kind of just ends awkwardly season two mm. started to flex a bit more but I think in season three you know by that stage in a in a show you know if the, if it's been the same writers usually season three four is when it really starts to find its real groove and yeah uh, like you said in this episode there aren't any huge standout shocking moments or crazy Larry situations. It's pretty tame by Curb's standards so far. You know, there's no aunt slash cunt situation or anything. I mean, the son's penis is pretty shocking, but they don't really, they don't get a lot out of that. It's just Larry awkwardly commenting on something that he shouldn't comment on. They don't, it's mm. not really explored in a shocking way. But um, yeah. yeah, just in terms of the writers handling lots of moving parts, you know, you've got the restaurant, you've got Ted Danson, you've got Hugh, you know, and, and I'm sure that the awkwardness between Larry and Hugh will come up later in the season because they've still got to be business partners yeah they're just they're more confident in their choices and they're better at handling each each episode's self-contained storyline as well as the moving parts of the overarching storylines in the background and the interplay between those two is uh is, yeah. is really starting to sort of find its groove and, and work really really well for sure for sure and uh next week steve uh, next week's episode a very uh well very interesting title it's called the terrorist attack <laughs> The terrorist attack. When did this come out? 2002, was it? Yeah, 13th of October, 2002, so the week after this one. Yeah, yeah so that'll be uh, that'll be interesting. I mean, just thinking back to that time and what was going on in media, obviously it was a year and a bit after September 11 and terrorism and America's reaction to terrorism and how the world was dealing with terrorism, et cetera, was very, very uh, on the minds of everyone. It was talked about mm. a lot. You know, it was it was almost like a, a new concept in, ev- in everyone's everyday life. So... I'm sure that I'm assuming that they'll play on that, you know, that'll be related to the terrorism and the topic of terrorism as it was at that time. Yeah, I mean, during the war on terror and back back in those days. But anyway, yes, that was The Nanny from Hell Season 4, or Season 3, rather, Episode 4. Thank you so much for listening. We do appreciate it. Uh, You can reach out to us via email, curbcastpod at gmail.com. We're also on social media, so check out the show notes for links to those. And, uh, yeah, my name's Ivan. And I'm Stephen. And we'll catch you next week for Episode 5 of season three geez we'll be halfway through the season already yeah it's uh it's moving quickly but uh it's it's getting better and better it sure is and uh yeah you take care of yourselves and each other you can also listen to our other podcast but i don't want to be a secondary character if you love seinfeld uh, which i'm sure you do if you're listening to this one so check both of them out and we'll see you next week Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of Mishmash Media, an independent podcast network. Follow us on social media at Mishmash Media AU or support us on Patreon. All those links are in the show notes.